Hello there. How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. I just thought I'd start about a minute early, maybe give some people time to log on. I, of course, wish we could all be together, but it has been nice to be able to talk to you this way. I sure hope you're doing well at home doing well in your studies and everything. You know, it occurs to me that you young people, your kids at your age, you learn the most stuff the fastest at this age. And I hope you're taking advantage of that. When you have some work to do for school, or you have some work that your parents want you to do, you learn it and you learn it well because you memorize things faster than any time in your life right now. And I hope that you uh, take advantage of that. All right. Well, while people continue to get on, I'm going to go ahead and sing a song. I'm going to sing one that the adults know, too. And I'm told that some of the kids know from their Bible classes. It's a song called Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. We know that if we trust God, and if we obey God, things will be a whole lot better for us than they would otherwise. Oh, there's no promise things will be perfect, and there's no promise there won't be any sad times, but he'll help us through those times if we trust him and we obey him. All right, let's go ahead and sing some of our songs that we usually do for this class. First, the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E Bible. That's right, that's right. And let's sing Jesus Loves Me. I hope you remember that he really does so deeply. He always wanted the little children to come to him. Sometimes the disciples would push the little children away, but Jesus would say, no, 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 let the little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. He wants everybody to be like little children in some ways, innocent and pure. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You remember that. Now, roll the gospel chariot along. The gospel is the word of God that we got to take to people. And you roll it along like you would roll a chariot in the old times or a car nowadays because you want more and more people to know it. Roll the gospel chariot along. Roll the gospel chariot along. Roll the gospel chariot along. And we won't tag along behind. If a brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If a brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If a brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. And we won't tag along behind. If a sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. If a sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. If a sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up up and we won't tag along behind if a sinner's in the way we will stop and pick him up if a sinner's in the way we will stop and pick him up if a sinner's in the way we will stop and pick him up and we won't tag along behind but if the devil's in the way we will roll right over him if the devil's in the way, we will roll right over him. If the devil's in the way, we will roll right over him. And we won't tag along behind. That's right. You got to get the devil out of your way. All right. What do we have next? Oh, that song I taught you last week about joy. Remember joy? J stands for Jesus first. O stands for others second. And Y stands for you last. And that's a great way to live. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. 
I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Way down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Way down in the depths of my heart to stay. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack to stay. Yeah, we don't want that devil in the way, do we? All right, let's sing the books of the New Testament. I remember those. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and a letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. Very good, very good. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. But the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up, and the house on the sand went splat. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you remember the days of creation? Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day three, day three, God made the grass and flowers and trees. Day three, day three, God made the grass and flowers and trees. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Sixth day, sixth day, God made beasts and man that day. Sixth day, sixth day, God made beasts and man that day. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Oh, you got lots of things memorized now, don't you? You got the days of creation memorized, the books of the New Testament memorized. Oh, and last time we started working on the apostles. I think you might know this song that helps you remember the names of the 12 that Jesus called to him. Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Next came Philip, Thomas, too, Matthew, and Bartholomew. James, the one they called the less, Simon, also Thaddeus. The twelfth apostle Judas made, Jesus was by him betrayed. Yes, Jesus called them, yes, Jesus called them, yes, Jesus called them, and they all followed him. And remember then, after he died and rose up from the dead, they went out and preached that good news to the whole world. And the whole world learned it. People obeyed, some of them obeyed, and we have a, a better place because of them. We have the hope of heaven because of them. Isn't that wonderful? All right, let's get ready for our Bible class. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. For God loves you and I love you and your teacher loves you too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. 
For God loves you and I love you and your teacher loves you too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. All right, let's study those cards now. I hope you're memorizing them. Who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has creation? Can you tell it to your parents? Genesis chapter 1. Who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has Sodom and Gomorrah? I skipped one, didn't I? Who could tell me what chapter has Sodom and Gomorrah? Genesis 19. Who could tell me what chapter of the Bible have the flood of Noah? Genesis 6 and 7. And who could tell me what chapter Joseph was sold by his brothers? Genesis 37. And who could tell me what chapters of the Bible have the ten plagues recorded? Exodus 7 through 12. And let's say them. Water to blood, frogs, lice, flies, cows got sick and died, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. And who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has the Ten Commandments? At least one of them. At least one of the chapters that has it. And that's Exodus chapter 20. That's right. Oh, let's say those two. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. That means want stuff other people have just to have it. All right, good deal. Now, who can tell me what chapter of the Bible has Hannah wanting a little baby boy? And she'd have a little baby boy named Samuel eventually. What chapter of the Bible is that? Oh, I gave you a clue, didn't I? It's in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And then who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has David beating Goliath by God's power? 1 Samuel chapter 17. And who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has Naaman, the Syrian general commander of the army, being healed of his leprosy? Naaman, N-A-A-M-A-N. That'd be 2 Kings chapter 5. That's correct. And who could tell me where the Sermon on the Mount is found? Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. That's right. And who could tell me where the model prayer is? Model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Let's say it. Now, we shouldn't pray it word for word all the time, but it's good to memorize it because part of this has already come true. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. We'll say his kingdom's already come. But let's say it again. Your, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then who could tell me, we're pressing on now, who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has the story of the death of John the Baptist. That would be in Matthew chapter 14, the death of John the Baptist. And then I'm going to go one more. Who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has God's instructions on marriage and divorce? That's Matthew 19. Now, I skipped one, didn't I? The ten apostles are in Matthew chapter 10. Now, Matthew chapter 14 has the story of the death of John the Baptist, and Matthew 19 has God's instructions on marriage and divorce. Now, interestingly, those two stories might go together just a little bit. I'll tell them to you real quickly. John the Baptist was a great preacher. God sent him in order to overcome the evil of the people and to try to turn the people back to God before Jesus came and preached to them. He was supposed to turn people to repentance. So John was doing a great job preaching, and he was kind of a rough character. He lived out in the wilderness. He wore a coat made out of camel's hair and uh, had a leather belt, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He, he wasn't a fancy man by any stretch of the imagination. Well, but what he was was a powerful preacher. Well, there was a ruler at that time named Herod, and Herod, this Herod Antipas was his name, evil, evil man. 
what he did was he was married, but he divorced his wife and stole his brother's wife and married her. Now, this was against God's law in the Old Testament, and it's against God's law in the New Testament. And so Herod stood up against that and told him he wasn't allowed to have Herodias, that woman, as his wife. Well, that made Herodias very angry. She finally worked it around to where she actually got John the Baptist killed for standing up for what was right. That's sad, isn't it? Jesus had some instructions in Matthew chapter 19 for marriage and divorce. Basically, what he wanted is this. One man and one woman for life. That's what he wants. Now, there's one exception for that that you'll find out when you get older, but what, basically what he wants is one man and one woman for life. So I hope you'll start thinking now when you're little that when you grow up, you want to marry someone who not only is a Christian and not only just been baptized, but you want to make sure their character, you want to make sure they did more than go through the motions. You want to make sure their character is such that they love God so much that they would never leave God. You want to marry somebody that loves God more than they love you. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah, my wife loves God more than she loves me. That's the way I want it, because that way she's always going to be committed to God. She'll, she'll go to heaven. And if a husband loves God and a wife loves God, then as they grow closer to God, they're going to grow closer toward each other. So I hope that's what you always do. You see, God made marriage. God made you. God made Adam. And then God made Eve. And then God declared that they ought to be one. He said, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, Jesus added to that in Matthew chapter 19. So God wants one man and one woman for life. That's his plan for marriage. Sometimes, tragically, it hasn't worked out. And some people have not had it work out the way they wanted it to. I understand that. But that was God's design. You work for that, okay? Well, God made you in his image, and he wants you to follow his plan so you can have the best life possible here and then an eternal life, much more importantly, with him in heaven. Remember that you're made in God's image, and you're special. Do you know, little child, what is in you? Can you dream, little child, of going far? Do you know, little child, of the power you've been given? Do you know, little child, whose you are? You were made in the image, in the image of God, just a little bit below the angels. And the masterpiece of heaven's hand is your body and your soul. You were made in the image, you were made in the image. You were made in the image of God, in the image of God. Don't forget how much God loves you. So do we. Let's pray. Your God, thank you for these children. Please bless them. Help them to have good lives ahead of them. Help them to do their very best to serve you, to do what you want them to, because they know how much you love them and did for them through Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus and all he's done for us. Please keep all these young people safe and healthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, kids, for joining us. I really, really enjoy this time of the week. I don't get to see you, but I love, I love trying to talk to you here, and I hope it does some good. As a, I miss being around you. And there's some kids out there I know that probably I've never met right now, but, but it warms my heart that you're watching, and we appreciate that. Well, I'm going to make a transition now to the, uh, the teen and adult class on some more serious subjects. People might wonder why sometimes we, we want to follow the Bible. The Bible has been around for a long time. A lot of people might take it for granted. We want to follow it. And some people question that. Why would we dare follow the Bible? Well, there's a whole lot to be said about that. And tonight I just want to make one little small point about that and for this i don't want to plagiarize because i've read some articles and some books i want to give credit where credit is due see i'm not an expert in <laughs> hardly anything but especially in the things i'm going to talk about tonight that have to do with the bible and science i'm not an expert in that so i kind of rely on some other people that study a lot more and write some things and i trust them there are a couple of articles on the site well one article 
but it was by Kyle Butt, who works at Apologetics Press, and it's called Scientific Foreknowledge and Medical Acumen of the Bible. That is, the Bible is accurate, even in scientific things, when it addresses scientific things. And then another book is going to be Kenny Barfield wrote Why the Bible is Number One. And then there's another book called uh, Prepare to Answer by a fellow named Shelley. So we're going to get, listen to those books and then one other article that I'll mention when we get there. There is a lot to be said about the scientific foreknowledge of the Bible. Do you realize that one of the great things that can be said about the Bible is that it doesn't make the mistakes that other books make. It doesn't make the errors that other books have in them or have had throughout history. In 1872, I think it was, a fellow by the name of George Ebers, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, a fellow by the name of George Ebers, an Egyptologist, had discovered a document that used to be used as an old medical document, a medical book. We, in our day and age, we want medical diagnosis. We go to WebMD, we go to the CDC, we look at diagnosis and treatment and all that sort of thing. Well, they didn't have the internet back then, but they had documents and they circulated documents about how to take care of people. This document, it was a papyrus, that means it was on a different kind of paper, and it was a, made on from the plant papyri, and it was like many other documents at that time. Well, it was called then the Papyrus Ebers. What it was was a detailed list of medical prescriptions, what to do if you're sick or what to do if you want a better health in a particular area. And in some cases, I understand, it got things right. But in some cases, it got things very wrong. And uh, some of the things were just really kind of gross and, and bad for you. But they thought that's what good medicine was. Now, this document was written probably about the time that Moses lived. Moses lived in uh, about 1500 or so BC, around that area, for 120 years. He lived then. And you remember that Moses grew up learned in all the ways and the wisdom of the Egyptians, according to Acts chapter 7, verse 22. Remember, he was sort of adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Even while he was raised by his Hebrew mother, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So he learned the ways of the Hebrews, and he learned the ways of the Egyptians. So Moses would have known all of these prescriptions, we think. But then Moses also, by the inspiration of God, wrote, the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the five books of law. And in those five books of law, there are things that the Israelites are told to do, not necessarily as medical prescriptions, but some of them had medical value to them. But one of the things that's interesting is Moses leaves out medical prescriptions that were popular in his day, but that we've come to find out were really not good for people. But Egypt back then, Egypt was well-respected. Everybody went to Egypt for their medicine. Egypt had the best healthcare system in the world. And everybody thought that the Egyptian doctors were the best in the world. Even up to the time about the 300s in the Medo-Persian Empire, King Darius was surrounding himself with Egyptian doctors because they were supposed to be the best in the world. Now listen with all that in mind to some of the things that were in this papyrus eber. Some of you I know have heard of it before. In this papyrus ebers, there were some prescriptions. For example, this one, to prevent the hair from turning gray. Well, a lot of people might be interested in that now because you can't get to the hair so can you? Well, to prevent the hair from turning gray, what did you do in ancient Egypt? Here's what you did. You took a black calf, boiled it in oil, then took its blood and smeared it on your head. That's what you did to keep your hair from turning gray. And if you didn't have any blood of a black calf boiled in oil, then you could take the fat of a rattlesnake and rub it on your head, and that would supposedly prevent your hair from turning gray. We know nowadays that doesn't work, and we know nowadays that's really gross. If you had a splinter in those days, an embedded splinter, here's how they treated it. They poured water over an idol, a, a rock, a stone, a piece of wood that they worshipped, and then they grasped some of that water and thought that it was magic water and they poured on that splinter. Idolatry sometimes leads people to some very curious medical uh, situations. And then if you, oh, let's see, if you had, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. 
the idle water was for poisonous snake bites. So if you had a poisonous snake bite, you would pour idols water over it, magic water that had been poured over an idol. That's what you do. But if you had an embedded splinter, here's what you do, and it's even worse. If you have an embedded splinter, you get some, you get some worms, you get the worm's blood, and you get some donkey manure, and you smear it on the embedded splinter, according to the ancient Egyptian papyrus Evers. That was a serious medical thing. Well, now we know that most likely kill you because you probably get lockjaw from the tetanus, the tetanus spores. And then also in the papyrus Evers, if you had certain skin diseases, you might rub some dog manure or some cat manure on them. Or if you wanted to prevent hair growth, which I can really understand that because bald is such a good look, you know. If you wanted to prevent hair growth, then you would take lizard dung or lizard manure, blood from a cow or from a donkey, pig, or a stag, mix that together and put it on your head to prevent hair. Now, that might prevent hair growth. I don't know, but it's a medically unnecessary thing. The hair just might be too scared to come out, I suppose, if you did something like that. But those are wild things that were in the papyrus Ebers, and that was common knowledge to use those things at the time of Moses, but Moses doesn't use any of those things in the Bible. Moses doesn't use any of that. And it's the absence of those things from the Bible that gives us one more point to prove that the Bible is valid. Now, idolatry can still have some bad consequences. False religion can still have some bad consequences. I read an article by Isla Slisko in Newsweek magazine online, April 16th, just last week. Well, I read it yesterday, but it was written just last week. And she's talking about the coronavirus and what people are trying to do to cure it. Some people of the Hindu religion in India are doing this to prevent coronavirus. They're drinking cow urine to prevent coronavirus. And then they brag that they've been bathing in cow manure for years. And it stands a little bit to reason because in that religion, among some portions of it, some people take it more seriously than others, the cows are revered and practically worshiped. I remember stories when I was a kid about how people would be starving in certain regions. They had plenty of cows, but they wouldn't eat them because they worshiped them. So false religion can have a bad effect on medicinal things as well. Even under the realm, quote, of Christianity, false religion can have a bad effect. There's one preacher in Brazil of, I think, the Pentecostal groups that claimed that if everybody would fast and pray for one day, that he would bring upon a miracle that would cure everybody. Well, he ought to know from reading his Bible that the age of, mir the age of miracles is past, and that, that's a false hope that he's given everybody. So you see, false religion connects to bad medicine in a lot of different ways. But true religion connects to good medicine in a lot of different ways. For example, in the subject of blood, in the Middle Ages, up until the 19th century, really, a lot of people thought if you were sick, it's because harmful vapors from the atmosphere somehow entered your bloodstream. So what they would do to get those harmful vapors out of your bloodstream was attach leeches to your body to suck the blood out, literally. And a lot of people had their blood sucked out to the point of death, including, I understand, our first president, George Washington. They thought some harmful vapors had gotten into him. They bled him with leeches and bled him to death. That's how he died. Well, see, uh, an untrue idea didn't necessarily emanate from, from, uh, from idolatry, but it was an untrue idea. Now, if these folks from the Middle Ages, 14, 1500 AD, in the year of our Lord, had gone back to 1500 or so BC, 3000 years before that, and read Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, they'd find this statement, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. 
And then they probably could have rationally concluded that you don't take blood out to save lives, you need blood. Today we know that. People give blood to save other people's lives when they need blood. We know that today, but it took a long time, even up to the last couple hundred years, for science to discover that when the Bible knew it 3,500 years ago. You see, God had knowledge of all these things, didn't he? And while he wasn't writing a science textbook, anytime the Bible refers to something scientific, it's going to be accurate. And it was often quite accurate long before people ever came to discover those things in the realm of science. Blood is one of those areas. Another area is the area that we're hearing a lot about nowadays, and that's sanitation and hand washing. The story is reported in several places, not just in this article or this book, but it's reported in a lot of places about a fellow by the name of Ignaz Simmelweis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. He was a German fellow, uh, Austrian fellow. In 1847 in Vienna, Austria, he ran a hospital and one of his specialties was uh, helping women who were giving birth. Well, he got kind of distressed because one out of every six women that came in to give birth would die of some kind of infection. 18% would come in and they would die. If they, if, if they had one of his doctors working with them, one out of every six of these women would die in childbirth. But if they had a midwife and not one of his doctors working with them, maybe at home or something, only 3% died. So he wondered, why is, this, why is this going on? Why are we losing everybody? Well, he tried different experiments. He tried turning the women on their sides and didn't have any luck with that. And furthermore, hospitals all over Europe and the Americas were having the same sorts of problems. Well, finally, he noticed something. His doctors were also students of medicine in every way. So what they were doing was this. They would go to one room and they would perform autopsies on dead bodies. And then they would simply dip their hands in cold, bloody water, wipe them off on a towel that everybody used. And then they'd go examine the women in the birthing departments. Can you see how infection would spread? That's unthinkable to us today. Well, when he then instituted a policy of strict hand washing, the mortality rates went completely went down, completely down, off the charts down. He just knew that hand washing would work. But when he suggested it, the scientific community mocked him, ridiculed him, until finally they would see that it works. Well, now hand washing to us is everything. Especially during these days, everybody says, wash your hands, sanitize. We know that good sanitation is effective in preventing disease, but they didn't know that in that regard up till 1847. But in the book of Numbers, chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, you see a whole system of washing and leaving people uh, and uh, washing and making sure that you're separate from people if indeed you might be sick. In Numbers 19, verses 11 and 12, watch this. He who touches the dead body of anybody shall be unclean seven days. That means in this day before all this fancy technology that we have, if you touched a dead body, you couldn't be around anybody for seven days, especially not examining patients in a hospital. In verse 12, he shall purify himself with water on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he will be clean. The water, we'll talk about what the water is, but he'd have to wash in that water on the third day and the seventh day, and then he would be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. Now, what was indeed that water? It's described for us up in chapter 19, starting at verse 1. Let's read there. Numbers 19, starting at verse 1. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, a cow without blemish, in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come. It's never worked uh, under a yoke, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not diseased. There's no problem. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with it. Oh, verse 3, I'm sorry. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. Well, sacrifice was a common thing in the Old Testament. And when then Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. That doesn't seem to have anything to do with cleanliness, but 
spiritual sim symbology to teach us things about how the blood is going to cleanse us and uh, spiritually and sacrifice it's given as, for the atonement for our souls and the sacrifices that's what the rest of leviticus 17 verse 11 had said but some of these things even though we're not told they're medically good turn out to be medically good medically beneficial watch what he says in verse 5 then the heifer shall be burned in his sight its hide its flesh its blood and its offal shall be burned and the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Takes these elements and puts them into the fire while the heifer is burning. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, because he's come close to a dead body, you see. He shall bathe in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening. And the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, bathe in water, and shall be unclean until evening. Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification it is for purifying from sin it had a spiritual purpose that was the main purpose here let's not forget that but if you read down through numbers 19 following then you're going to find that anybody that would come in contact with death anybody that come in contact with a dead body had to be washed with this water of purification now, it doesn't sound like it's much medically, but Kyle Butt in that one article has put together the research for us from medical encyclopedias and other documents written by doctors, including one by a fellow by the name of Massengill who wrote in 1943 sketches of medicine and pharmacy. And he says that um, this concoction that they had of ashes, scarlet wool, hyssop, uh, cedar wood, well, listen to how beneficial it was. He goes through it point by point. Some of you might be old enough to remember lye soap, L-Y-E. Or you've read about how on the frontier, pioneers made their own soap sometimes. And one of the most common ways to get lye, to get the lye for the soap, was to pour water through ashes. So here he's pouring water through ashes. And they're getting something like we put in our lye soap. If lye comes in too much concentration, it can be very acidic. It's often used in drain cleaners. But if it comes in the right concentration, it can exfoliate a hand and get the dirt and the filth off of it. And that's why a lot of people had lye soap. Well, it poured water through ashes, just kind of like Numbers 19. And then hyssop would be a plant that would come, and they would put some hyssop in that. And Mr. Butt says that hyssop, was an antiseptic, an antiviral oil. And still, essential oils and some people like that use it in their products. So you have an antiseptic along with the equivalent of the beginnings of lye soap. And you have an antiviral, something to combat viruses, in the beginning of this lye soap. And then cedar wood. This article goes through about how cedar wood has been used for many good purposes through the years. A lot of times storage cabinets are made out of cedar wood because cedar wood repels insects and prevents decay. And then in the oil form that comes from the leaves and twigs applied to humans, cedar wood has antiseptic qualities, expectorant qualities, that is, it gets mucus out of the lungs like you'd have in some sort of respiratory disease. Uh, it's an antifungal. It's a sedative to help you sleep, and it's an insecticide to keep people away. The cedar leaf with alcohol and water is used to inhibit influenza A. It's a flu vaccine. And then it's also used against eczema. It's also rich in vitamin C, treats scurvy, and has therefore become called sometimes the tree of life. And then the other ingredient they had in this water of purification was scarlet or probably scarlet wool. And this article says that that kind of topped off the whole mixture as an ancient lava soap. So, yeah, it had blood in it for spiritual purposes, but it also had all these antiseptics in it and these antivirals that predated people discovering this by thousands and thousands of years. And then there's the subject of quarantine. I'm glad nobody's in the room with me so they won't hit me for mentioning it. 
But there is the subject of quarantine, and I thought it might be apt for us to study that during this time. I read recently where some others have, uh, but let's study it for just a minute. And why the Bible is number one, Kenny Barfield speaks about quarantine, and Mr. Butt spoke about it in his article as well. In ancient times, at best, people might be quarantined because somehow they offended the gods, and you didn't want to have them around for hardly anything like medical reasons. And the um, idea of contagious diseases didn't really come around for a real long time, so people were kind of cavalier about sanitation and cavalier about being together. Anytime there might be a disease, they just didn't realize that they would spread it. Most people trace the idea of contagious diseases, contagion, back to about the 1500s AD. But back here in 1500 BC, as one author said, the Hebrews were the first to recognize the communicability of diseases. They were the first to recognize that it could spread. If you'll read Leviticus 13 and 14 sometime, you'll have your head spinning about by all that the priests had to do. But the priests had prescriptions for diagnosing and treating leprosy. Leprosy has been a scourge upon mankind for a long time. In modern first world countries, we can treat it with a mixture of antibiotics. It's now called Hansen's disease, and it can be pretty pretty uh, mild in this regard, but in still a lot of places, there are the leprosoriums, there are the places, there are the people that were just had to be shut off from society because nobody else wanted to catch it. Well, the first time you ever get instruction like that in the history of the world, as far as I know, is in the Bible. In 1500 BC, they learned the subject of quarantine 3,000 years before mankind discovered it through science. In Leviticus chapter 13, you can read how the, the priest could diagnose the disease, and then he could mark one as unclean, and he'd have to stay away from everybody else. Or the priest might see that does the disease might be coming. If there'd be a boil or a scab or something, he guy was supposed to go show himself to the priest, and the priest could watch for if the hair was turning white or if the flesh, if the wound was getting deeper than the skin. Those seem to be the two telltale signs. And if it looked like it was going that direction, he was supposed to quarantine the fellow for seven days and then examine him again. And if it still was unsure, quarantine him for another seven days and then wait and make sure. And notice that quarantine of 14 days is what they're recommending for people now that think they might have possibly been in contact with the coronavirus. And then the separation and the isolation of the diseased person all the way back there in 1500 B.C., in Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, if they find that someone definitely has leprosy and he's a guy, he's supposed to, if anybody ever gets close to him, original social distancing here, if anybody ever gets close to him, he's supposed to cover his mouth and shout, unclean, unclean. You know why he covers his mouth? Serves like a mask, keeps the droplets from getting out there. So the Bible had quarantine in hand long before people, and then what are they telling you nowadays? If you come from the store or something, you come from a doctor's office, take your clothes off, wash them, get a different set of clothes, sanitize everything. We read in Leviticus 14 that if somebody's clothes came in touch with someone who had leprosy, they had a prescription about whether or not to tell the leprosy was in it, whether or not they needed to destroy the clothes. And then even their houses, it, you could have leprosy laying on the walls, of, lying on the walls of the houses and there were prescriptions for what the priest to do was to do if it was there too much, he was to wait and see, and then if it was there still too much still, the house was just to be torn down. So the ancient Hebrews, 3,000 years before man discovered it, knew exactly what to do for quarantining and keeping people out of harm's way. The, the doctor, S. E. Massengill wrote in his book a sketch of medicine and pharmacy. At least I think he was a doctor. He he wrote in the prevention of disease. However, the ancient Hebrews made real progress. The teachings of Moses, as embodied in the priestly code of the Old Testament, contain two clear conceptions of modern sanitation, the importance of cleanliness, and the possibility of controlling epidemic disease by isolation and quarantine. You know where quarantine came from as far as we know in, in modern times? 
According to the CDC website, in the 14th century, there would be ships coming in to Venice from infected areas. Well, the Venetian government, the Italian government, started a policy of those people had to stay on those ships for 40 days before they would be allowed on to land to make sure that they weren't sick and they weren't carrying something. Quarantine comes from the Italian quaranta giorno, which means 40 days. And now what do you see? Cruise ships with people having to stay on. The Hebrews knew this long ago. This is evidence of the scientific foreknowledge in the Bible, and this is evidence of the inspiration of the Bible. How else would people know way back then before science discovered it what to do? Well, I mean, you see what God had done? He'd separated his own special people and he wanted to keep them pure and keep them alive so that the Christ could come through them. So he gave them all these rituals. He didn't tell them why. He just expected to, him to obey them. He didn't tell them all the medical reasons. But here we come to find out that in addition to the spiritual reasons that he gave, there were protective reasons for their physical health. That continues into the realm of food. You might read Leviticus 11 sometime, and Deuteronomy 14, and find about what some clean and unclean animals were for the Jews. Now, in the New Testament times, all animals were clean, were allowed to eat anything. And in some ways, you know, since then, we found ways to purify some of these animals. But listen to some of these stats and see where God might have been coming from when he gave these rules to the ancient Hebrews. In uh, 1953, a fellow by the name of Mocht in a Johns Hopkins University study, so a very well-reputed study, decided he would test some things. He took some seedlings and made a sample uh, of seedlings that would grow in regular circumstances, in their regular environments. And then he took seedlings and put them in the juices of clean animals, clean as described in the Old Testament, that had uh, the clove hoof, and chewed the cud. And then he would put more seedlings in the juices of unclean animals. So you got that? The sample, seedlings growing like they regularly would, and then seedlings in the juices of the clean animals the Jew, the, that the Jews were allowed to eat, the animals the Jews were allowed to eat, and then seedlings in the unclean animals that the Jews were not allowed to eat. Well, listen to some of his findings. In juices from an ox, the seeds grew 91% as often as they would in the sample of their regular environment. 91%, that's pretty close. If they were placed in sheep, all these clean animals, the, the seeds grew 94% as often as they would in their regular circumstance. If he put them in juice from a calf, they would grow 82% as often as they would in the sample. And if you put them in a goat, they would grow 90%, and in a deer, 90% of what they would from their original uh, situation, their, uh, their intended circumstances. But if he put them in unclean animals, if he put seedlings in meat juice from pigs, which was an unclean animal for the Jews, only 54% of the time would those seedlings grow as often as the original sample. And if you put them in rabbit, 49% as opposed to the natural circumstances. In a camel, 41% as opposed to the natural circumstances. And in a horse, 39% as opposed to the natural circumstances. In other words, there could have been some problems with these unclean animals that besides just God saying, just do what I told you, don't ask questions, Besides that, it was for their health. It was for their well-being. Now, today we eat pig and we have some other things, even though, even though they're, uh, they still have the same problems, but we've learned some cooking methods. And one of the great dangers is undercooked pork. I don't hear anybody asking for raw pork in a, in a, in a steakhouse or anything like that because everybody knows the danger of that. Well, they just didn't know all the danger of that then, but they had God telling them, just don't eat that. I'll provide you plenty of something else. Just don't eat that. And if they did that, then they'd have much less of a chance of disease. Also in Leviticus 11 and 12, they were not supposed to eat fish unless they had fins and scales. Well, consider this one example. Blowfish have fins but no scales. They also have a toxin 
that is 1,250 times more deadly than cyanide. There's a toxin in blowfish that's 1,250 times more deadly than the known poison cyanide. And this toxin is 160,000 times more potent than cocaine. A tiny amount of the toxin of a blowfish can kill 30 grown adults. It was one of the unclean things for the Jews. They weren't allowed to eat it. Now, people eat blowfish today, but they're putting themselves at risk because even the processes that we have today are pretty unsure. And then this uh, instruction of God to eat seafood with fins and scales would leave out shellfish. And the FDA recommends against raw oysters, and a lot of people can get sick from shellfish faster than they can anything else if it's not done correctly and they carry a lot of bacteria and then the bible prescribed that reptiles shouldn't be eaten you can look on in leviticus 11 and see that well the cdc recommends the reptiles alive not be kept as pets in households that have children under five years old you know why they carry a bunch of salmonella which can make you really sick and not only can you get the salmonella if the reptile spits on you or bites you not only can you get the salmonella if you touch the reptile, but if the reptile touches the wall and you touch the wall, you can get the salmonella. So God told him just to stay away from those things. And then bats. God specifically mentioned some birds not to eat. One of those was bats. Now that comes up in our modern times as well. And get me, I don't know what happened. I don't ha claim to know anything about how we got the coronavirus. I just know that's one of the theories that's been out there floated. And I don't know at this point if it's discredited or credited or, or what you have, and I'm not saying anything about that. But I am saying, if people are eating bats, they're, they're doing a very dangerous thing. And that's one reason that God, 1500 years before Christ, 3,500 years before now, told people just not to eat them. Besides whatever's happening now, for a long time, it's been known that if you come in contact with a bat, you're very likely to get rabies. And the CDC guidelines, or the medical guidelines at least, have been that if you come in contact with a bat, go get preventative treatment for rabies right away, even if you don't show any symptoms, because they're that contagious. And yet, there are some people in the world probably that are still eating bats, and it's probably one of those examples of how uh, people not listening to good sanitation things can cause cause very cause a lot of problems but we can't be too judgmental about that because we eat a lot of pork in this country and that was an unclean animal in the old testament but we we know how to cook it right we know what to do with it last example and that is uh, circumcision in genesis chapter 17 god gave circumcision as a sign for the jewish people baby boys were to be circumcised on the eighth day of their lives well, I knew some of this, but didn't know all of it until this research this week. So let me read to you from some of it. In the chart form, Holt Pediatrics illustrates that the percent of available prothrombin in a newborn, prothrombin, along with vitamin K, is what clots your blood so that you don't just keep bleeding out. You know how before surgery, the doctors have to make sure you're off all your blood thinners and things like that. Well, you need blood clotting to stop the bleeding when you've had somebody cut into you. Well, you're being cut into on a, on a severe basis in circumcision, even though you're a baby, you won't remember, it's a pretty serious surgery, and it was supposed to be done on the eighth day. Well, why is that? Well, prothrombin in newborns dips from about 90% of normal on its day of birth to about 35% on the third day of life outside the womb. So you don't have much blood clotting agent on the third day of your life. After the third day, the prothrombin begins, prothrombin begins to climb, and by the eighth day of the child's life, the prothrombin is at 110% of normal, 20% higher than it was on the first day of life, and 10% more than it will be the rest of the child's life. He has the most blood clotting agent in his body on day eight than he does at any other time in the rest of his life. It's the perfect day for surgery, especially without being able to. Inject. Well, we have circumcision for babies on their first day of life now, but they inject them with these things. They didn't do that then, so they just went with the nature. Now, God didn't tell them all that. We know that from science. But we're left to wonder, how did the Bible 
know these things. It can be demonstrated that Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, Num Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy were written 1,500 years before Christ. There are a few doubters out there, but by and large, most people accept that, and it's demonstrable. And how do we have all these things in it that predate medical science and tell us what is good for us and have none of the mistakes of the ancient Egyptians who were supposed to be the medical experts of the world, how is it that we have all that? The only answer is that there had to be a superintending mind behind it. There had to be genius behind it that was above mankind revealing it to him. And that's what we have in the Bible, God's revealed word. And we might also notice that if these Israelites kept these laws, wouldn't they have been much better off? I don't know exactly how much they kept the clean and the unclean and how much they did the quarantine thing, but there it was for them. And if they would have kept these things, they'd have been much better off. But if they wouldn't, they'd have opened themselves up to a lot of danger physically, but more sadly, much more tragically, they would have brought tragedy upon themselves spiritually. Because if we don't listen to God, we harm ourselves. We harm ourselves greatly now and in eternity. I hope this study might have been helpful to people looking for reasons to, uh, looking for something to believe in. Believe in the body. This is only one reason of a whole field of study that proves that the Bible had to come from a superintending, supernatural, divine mind behind it. And I hope it's one that you'll consider. It's timely. I hope it's one that you'll consider. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for all the great things you've told us throughout history. We thank you for all the evidence that the Bible is your word. And beyond the scientific and beyond what seems maybe like it's tedious sometimes in some ways, we thank you for the grand story of the Bible that tells us about Jesus Christ coming to die for our sins. We pray, Father, that people will be sensitive to that need and follow Jesus. Follow him, love him, serve him for who he is and for what he's done for us and for the great hope and expectation of seeing him again someday in heaven if we've been obedient to him on this earth. We thank you for everything you've given us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If anybody would ever like to talk more about this, I'd be glad to. Like I said, I'm, an, I'm no expert in these particular subjects, but we can find resources that can help us and also uh, you more importantly would like to talk about uh your soul salvation i'd love to do that with you well thank you lord willing i'll be here sunday morning at 11 o'clock and sunday afternoon at five o'clock to study the bible some more with you we'll be on different topic then we'll be lord willing back in the book of acts and see the first sermon about jesus christ being resurrected from the dead that's an exciting sermon thank you for joining tonight good night